Good afternoon. Hi. Welcome, everyone. My name is Fuji Wittenberg. Uh, welcome to my webinar, Work Visa Options After OPP. Um, we will go ahead and get started now. I wanted to introduce myself again. My name is Fuji Wittenberg. I'm an attorney at um, Wolfsdorf Immigration Law Group. We are a uh, firm specializing in immigration law. And uh, we've been you know, doing this for a very long time. We have offices in uh, Santa Monica, which is in Los Angeles and New York, in case you do need assistance. And what I'll do is go ahead and kind of give you a little bit of information. What I'll do is I'll go through the, the webinar. If you do have questions, um, please try to, you can either type them to me. I may not be able to answer. I'll try and do a Q&A afterwards if we have time. If not, what, if you can just email. Um, you know, either type your questions here or you can email me separately. And then please just, you know, give me a couple of days to get back to you. I, I, I'll try and, you know, I'll do my best. Um, and obviously each situation is unique and different. And so I'll go through general options. Um, but in no way, you know, I, I want to be very clear that um, this isn't, you know, direct legal advice to you because each situation is unique and it's so fact specific. But it's, um, I think, will give you some ideas and some options and hopefully a little bit of information as well to make uh, your transition a little bit easier as you're looking forward to what your options are. You can always visit our website. We'll have future webinars on different topics and different visa categories that are more specific. Um, you can you know, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. We have a newsletter, a monthly newsletter that goes out, so you can sign up for that as well. And then again, here's my contact information, and with that, um, I will go ahead and get started. Okay, so um, just a recent update. Oh, sorry. Recent update: uh, paperless I-94 cards for those of you who, um, you know, all along have been used to the white I-94 card stapled into your passport. Um, starting in May, and in, in, here in LA, it was uh, May 14th they started to implement an electronic I-94 card. So it's been really confusing for people. Um, they're expecting that, and people are filling them out, or they're not sure <laughs> you know, why they don't get it. But what is happening is they're pulling the information from flight manifests and uh, recording, kind of logging your um, entry date based on the flight itself. And when you come through, they'll just stamp your passport, like the physical ink stamp. But the I-94, you have to actually retrieve it electronically. If you go to www.cbp.gov slash I-94, you can put in your passport, number, date of birth, name, and, and all of that information, and you should be able to retrieve it. I just suggest doing it. It takes about a day for it to be updated into, um, into the system. But um, you know, it should be there, and I recommend downloading it just in case there are any errors. And also, for those of you um, who are working or who will be, you know, you would need the I-94 if you, you know, are applying for, um, you know, any sort of visa. You do need the I-94 and the information from there. So that's just a little update. And hopefully, you know, there have been some glitches, but I do think it's going to be better. And for, um, for Canadians and Mexicans at land border at ports of entry, they're still using the paper card. Okay. So for those of you, I mean, some of you may currently be students and you're not yet graduating or you're close to graduating this year or you have already graduated and you're in your OPT. I'll try and give kind of general information for everybody. Uh, CPT and OPT, what are they? Um, CPT is curricular practical training. Um, so that's when you work while you're in school. It has to be part of your curriculum. It'll be approved by the school. There's OPT, which is optional practical training, and that's one year of work authorization uh, after you graduate. It's the only time you're going to get this kind of a freebie. But it's full-time employment after graduation, and um, you have to have your EAD card when you start working, and you have to make sure your I-20 is endorsed for employment as well. So um, OPT is great, and hopefully you know, everybody takes advantage of it. There is something, so for most people, um, and this is important, you know, there is OPT. Everybody who graduates um, from a program will get the one year, a 12 month OPT, and that's pretty standard. There is a special extension um, for STEM degrees, 
and STEM degrees include science, technology, engineering, and math. If your degree is in any of your U.S. degree is in any other field, you are not eligible for the STEM extension. And I get that question a lot. There's no other way to extend your OPT. You know, no matter what the circumstances are, it is what it is. It's just that 12 months. Um, but for those of you who are fortunate to be studying in the STEM fields, you can have your 12 months. And then you can you know, extend it for an additional 17 on top of that 12. So it really, really does help a lot of times for people you know, in those fields. Um, you can check the list. That your degree has to be on the list. It's um, at the website listed here, uh, ice.gov, or ice slash gov slash see this. Um, the job, there are a couple of conditions with that. It's not automatic. You have to have a job first. Your job has to directly relate to your degree major. And the employer has to be registered with E-Verify, which is a government program um, you know, that where not just your information, your I-9 information is logged in, but the whole company has to implement it for all of their I-9s. So for smaller companies, it's not that big of a deal. Larger companies are probably already registered with E-Verify, um, but it is definitely a condition of the the OPT STEM extension, so it's something to be aware of, um, that it's not automatic. Um, and that you can, it is okay to change employers while, while you're on your STEM extension, but again, those same conditions apply. The new employer must also be registered and you verify, and, and the job must be related to your major. Unemployment periods, this is also another big question. I know the economy is definitely getting better, but there are, you know, I think employers are still, you know, a little weary and, and it's still hard. Um, so you are allowed to have 90 days of unemployment, up to 90 days, but no more than in the 12-month period, and it's 120 days for, um, for uh, STEM OPT. So you can have that. How to avoid, you know, unemployment, you know, the volunteer, but at, you know, just a minimum of 20 hours, but in your field of study. So it should be related to what you will be doing. Um, something, and again, OPT is really, really close, you know, I think I have, we have our knowledge, but really you should stay in close contact with your ISO and they can really help you and guide you hopefully with any issues that you do have, especially with timing um, and any other information you need regarding specifics and, and also endorsing your I-20. There is a 60-day grace period once your OPT ends, so let's say your OPT ends on October 1st you get a 60-day window where you are eligible to continue to be here in the U.S. You can't work, but you're allowed to be here, um, kind of tie up some loose ends, or um, you know, you can find a new job, and you can even file a, a change of status visa petition during that window, but again, you're not eligible to work. You're, you, know, you can be here to visit, so that's something nice to remember. Um, OPT, don't forget to apply, whether or not you have a job, um, whether or not um, you plan on staying, maybe you're like, oh, I'm going to go back after I finish or graduate. It's something that it, it costs relatively very little and something that, you know, comes with graduating. So I definitely, definitely urge you to apply for it. Again, even if you don't use it, it's something that you will have. I always get phone calls and emails from people saying, oh, I just didn't do it. It's kind of a, you know, it's not kind of, it is a use it or lose it um, benefit that you do get. So I would take advantage of it. Check again with your, uh, you know, someone just asked what's an ISO. ISO is your international student office. Um, so check with them in terms of what the program end date is to make sure you're filing during, you know, within the right window because if you don't file, um, within, you know, 90 days prior to or up until 60 days after the program end date, you're, you're no longer eligible. So you should always check with your school for the exact filing dates. And then, you know, the other reason I say OPT is great because this is your opportunity to hopefully impress the employer so much that they want to, you know, they'll kind of do whatever they can to help with the visa process. Maybe not immediately, you know, within the first few months, but maybe, you know, around six months or something like that, you would be able to have that conversation to look into a different sort of longer-term visa sponsorship. So I, I think it's also great, and it's risk-free for the employer. There's nothing that they have to do. There's no, 
you know, prevailing wage or anything like that that they have to submit. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of easy for them. So I definitely, definitely recommend it. Um, so let's say you graduate, you do your 12 months of OPT. Now, what are your options after that? For most of you, once you finish, I mean, the broadest visa category is the H-1B. Um, it's a professional occupation visa. It has to be, you know, the job itself it has to be a professional job, which means it has to, you know, that it requires at least a bachelor's degree in that field to perform the job. So classically speaking, it would be an accountant or a software engineer, graphic designer, financial analyst, um, you know, a teacher, a professor, you know, it's, there are lots of classic positions, but there are a lot of others that also fall, fall under this um, that do require someone with at least a bachelor's degree. And so the job has to require it. But, and you also have to have that um, degree, but the job also has to be. And that's also something that people tend to confuse. It's not just about you having it. It's also that the job um, is professional. Um, it's an employer-specific visa, meaning if you have, you want to work part-time with two companies, or if um, just because you have an H-1B with company A doesn't mean you can use that same visa to work for company B. You're only authorized with that company. You are eligible for part-time or full-time employment, which is also quite nice. If it's part-time, you know, it, it can't be, um, you know, thir 35 hours a week just so they can pay you part-time wages, that doesn't really work. Um, part-time would really have to be part-time, and it's an hourly thing. But that's also a, a, a way of kind of um, making a little bit easier for everybody. And you can have concurrent H's, meaning you can file a couple at the same time if you want to work for multiple employers, if you have two part-time offers or something like that. There is a six-year maximum. There's a, an exception I'll talk about later once you apply for green card or once you start that process. And it's granted in three-year increments. So again, you know, you graduate, one year of OPT, hopefully you'll do the H-1B, which will give you six years. And during that six years, generally speaking, you really are, are you know, moving towards a more permanent um, situation, hopefully green card. But um, again, there are tons of other options, too. Uh, portability is another important aspect of the H-1B, meaning you're not, you know, the, you're not tied to that employer. If you do find another position, uh, and the employer, new employer does want to sponsor you, you can transfer your H-1B. It's not just, um, you know, you have to file a change of employer petition with all of the fees and every, all the paperwork and, you know, everything else. But you don't have to worry about the H-1B cap. So I'm about to talk about the cap very, very soon. Someone just asked, uh, can you transition from part-time H-1B to full-time? Yes, you can. You just have to be paid um, the higher wage. Or, you know, you just have to be getting paid the full-time salary. Okay, so the H-1B cap or the quota, uh, there are different ways to, you know, kind of call it. There is a limit. Um, there's a limit and there's a specific time frame during which you can apply for the H-1B if you're a private employer. And it's, it's only for private employers um, that you're limited, you know, by these, by these um, uh, measures. The, it's based on the fiscal year, so October 1st to September 30th of the following year. And there are 65,000 H-1B visas per fiscal year. And within the 65, um, there is 5,400 for Singaporeans and, and 1,400 for Chileans. Uh, but on top of the 65, there's an additional 20,000 visas for U.S. graduates with a master's or higher uh, degree. So if you have a master's or a Ph.D., um, you're in a separate category, a separate cap, and that tends to, you know, kind of run out more slowly because there are less uh, people with master's degrees um, and doctorates than there are with bachelor's degrees. So 70, the 65,000 is bachelor. We call it the bachelor's cap, and then the 20,000 is the master's cap. Um, how early can you fly or file? Uh, the the date that you can file is on April 1st. So right now. You can't file, but you can next um, April 1st. And for those of you, who are, you who are unfamiliar with the cap, let me you know give you a quick little history about the timing issues. You know, prior to previously, you know, before the 
<clears throat> economy kind of took a, a little bit of a nosedive. From 2003 to 2009, there was something that we called March Madness, completely unrelated to basketball. Um, it was <clears throat> during that month we would prepare, you know, tons and tons of H-1B petitions and file on April 1st because they would receive almost double the the cap. The more than so they would read or they would receive like 140,000 uh, petitions to fill the 65,000. They started this uh, computer-generated lottery <clears throat> where everybody you prepare it, you file it on you know April 1st. Everybody filed it, and during that first week, they would randomly select the petitions, and then they they would receipt those in and reject, you know, the the others that didn't make it. They wouldn't cash the filing fee checks or anything, but you would get them rejected, and so the person would just have to wait and file the following year, or think of you know, kind of come up with a different option. So that's how it was, and then when the economy um, started to go down, employers weren't hiring as much. So the cap stayed open much, much longer, which was a total change of pace for everybody, for all of us practitioners, but also for people, um, you know, for foreign nationals, for students. It gave them much more flexibility, a little bit more wiggle room in terms of, you know, having that job offer in place and having, you know, every, all of their requirements met. So to give you an idea, I've listed um, the day the cap was reached. So. Um, opening on April 1st, you know, that, that year in 2009, uh, it stayed open from April till December, and then um, the following year it stayed open April to January, then April to November, and then this past year it, um, uh, it opened, actually didn't even, yeah, no, it's here, then it was June, and then this past April, USCIS announced that the H-1B cap was reached on April 5th, and so a lottery was conducted. It was the shortest filing season since 2008. I, you know, my crystal ball is as good as yours, but I'm assuming if things continue this way, for those of you who are, you know, either who have graduated or will be graduating, you know, in December or next spring, you know, you will have to file on April 1st. The issue that comes up, um, and for those of you here in your OPT, you have to have met the degree requirements. So that's something important to be aware of. So since most degree programs don't end until you know May or June, you have to have actually like met all of the requirements for the degree in order to file. So that's where it's great. You know, you have to have that OPT to carry you through, and then you file the year after. A lot of people want to. Um, apply before. Um, they're like, oh, I don't need OPT, let me just skip it and I'll file for my H-1B. That's just something, you know, kind of timing-wise to be aware of. Um, and again, I don't know what's going to happen this, this next year, but we filed this past year. I was happy. I was lucky I filed everything that first week and, and it was, you know, reached that first week. I don't know um, what it'll be like, but it's something to, again, keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, what your options are next um, another concept that you guys should be aware of, H-1B cap gap extension, it applies to all F-1 students who timely file their H-1B petition during the acceptance period, so on or after April 1st. Timely, um, you know, means you have to file it while um, your duration of stay or status is still in effect. Um, it's, your F-1 status is automatically extended. And um, your employment authorization is also automatically extended, but only if it's filed prior to your OPT expiration date. So this is also something important to think about when you're strategizing when you choose your OPT start date because um, you want to make sure that you give yourself enough time. Um, I have a, the next couple slides somewhere I have a little bit of a, like a chart to show you. Um, but basically what will happen is as long as you file your H-1B before your OPT expiration, your F-1 status as well as your work authorization are automatic or just are extended until it's adjudicated, which means you get a decision on your case, or September 30th, so no later than September 30th. Um, if it's denied for some reason or rejected, you have 60 days from the date of notification. So. A lot of times people worry that it'll, you know, back go back to, like if your OPT expired on May 1st, 
for instance, and then you don't find out until August that it was denied, it's not like, you know, it goes back to May 1st and you've been out of status for three months or whatever. It would, you know, be from that date you received the letter in August and you would have 60 days from there. Okay. Let me just. Okay, so here's my little chart. I need to update the dates here a little bit, but this, you know, classically speaking, you know, for those of you who are on the um, semester system and you graduate, let's say graduation is May, um, so somebody who graduated in May 2012, um, and, and you can select the dates, and that's where I say, you know, work with your international student office um, in terms of choosing, making sure, you know, it's done within the proper time frame, but at the same time to maximize you know, your time and flexibility. But let's see, uh, here, is, you know, you graduate in May, you have your OPT starts in June. So you have OPT for one year, June 2012 to June, July, you know, let's say 2013. Um, what you have to do is make sure that you file your H-1B before your OPT expiration, so on April 1st. And then basically, rather than having the stop work between July and October when the H-1B kicks in, you get to continue being here and working. It's called cap gap. It's something that they um, changed, I think, in 2008 <clears throat> to help students out. Because what was happening is during the summers, basically, uh, there was this gap where you know their OPT would end for either, usually like two, three months. And they can't start until October 1st, so they literally would have to um, either go off of payroll and stop working or leave the country, depending. So that's, this is a nice way of getting you to October 1st. So literally, it's just that you, know, you have to file it as a change of status, but it gives you that relief and you don't have to worry about traveling or anything else. Um, you, know, you shouldn't travel during that cat gap period. Um, and again, like I said before, if for some reason there's a lottery and you're not, you know, your petition's not selected or <clears throat> Um, it's denied or whatever, it only, you know, ends upon notice of that, so it doesn't, you know, backdate. So um, it is something that's there to help. Um, just a quick overview of the process itself, who's involved, which agencies, how do you do it, how much does it cost, who's responsible for what, <laughs> what are the issues. There's an overview here. I, I don't want to get too bogged down in the details because I want to get to some other options especially since right now nobody can, you can't really apply for an H-1B unless you, um, and I don't know if I skipped this in the slide, but, or it may come up later, you can apply for an H-1B if you have a job offer with, um, you know, an, a kind of a nonprofit or like a university or hospitals or things like that associated with nonprofits. I'll get to that, academic institutions. Um, so, you know, again, the quota and the April 1st timeline, that's only for private employers. Anyways, I sidetracked. The two agencies involved here are the Department of Labor, which is the first step. Uh, we have to prepare and file an LCA. With that LCA, your employer is making certain promises that they're going to pay you a certain wage. <clears throat> There's a prevailing wage that you have to be paid. And then the second step is with once that's certified, then you can file the forms and support letter and everything else with the USCIS. Um, let me see. Uh, common issues, special, is it a specialty occupation? They love to, you know, pick on that. <clears throat> um, what, uh, you know, is the degree related to the occupation? You know, anything, or a lot of times things related to sales and marketing for some reason, they pick on that or they tend to, or if it's, you know, entertainment related, a lot of times they really say, do you really, really need a degree um, to perform, you know, to do this job? Uh, and there's something called Vibe where they check, you know, this, um, it's a system that they check for, in, regarding the employer. So those are just some common things. Um, there's a six-year maximum we talked about. Uh, the cap does not apply to extension, so you only have to be counted in the cap once. And so you don't have to worry about it every other time if you change employers or um, if you switch, um, you know, or if you leave and you're coming back, you don't have to worry about it later. Uh, there's an H-1B remainder option. So if anyone that's listening who's previously held an H-1B and they didn't use their full six years, you can actually switch, you know, I have an example here, H-1B to F-1. Let's say you did your bachelor's, 
he worked on an H-1B for a year or two, and then you went back to school for your master's degree or an MBA, and you want to, you know, you graduate, you, do, you get a second OPT because it's a higher degree. If you do a bachelor's and a bachelor's, you don't get a second OPT, but if you do, you know, bachelor's to master's or master's to doctorate, you do. Um, you do that, and then you don't want to wait for the cap. You are eligible to use the rest of your time, whatever is left. Um, on your, you know, your H-1B before, since you're accounted before. Um, and then another way would be to, um, if you're outside of the U.S., uh, you can recapture unused time, um, or you can file for a new six years, but you'd be subject to the cap. In terms of employer obligations, um, there are several, and someone just asked what's the prevailing wage now. Uh, I think I'll get to that soon. Um, the employer, this is the biggest issue mostly um, that we talk about a lot is the prevailing wage. And that's determined <coughs> um, by going to this link that I have here. And it's really, it's based on your, not only your occupation, but also where you live, um, your metropolitan um, area. So you would go there, you put in, you know, software engineer, or, you know, it'll be like California, Los Angeles County software engineer, and then the, there are four levels. You know, level one is really entry level, and level four it would be somebody who's very senior. Um, so they are obligated to pay you whatever that prevailing wage is. I will be honest with you, I do think it's slightly higher than what is probably the industry norm. It is going to be, um, I mean, anyways, I will tell you that I think it is. Uh, realistically, it is. Um, why they do it, I, you know, again, I don't know, um, but it is what it is. <laughs> so don't be shocked when you go to it, or actually on, on your side, you're happy, but on the employer side, they're like, oh, that's a lot. That's more than we pay our other employees. Um, another obligation is that they can't bench you, which means um, just because it's a slow season uh, at work, they can't say, oh, you know, we don't have enough work with work for you, and since we don't, since you're not working, we don't have to pay you. You have to be on payroll, and you know they have to continue to um, to pay you. Uh, you can take a voluntary leave of absence. Um, for instance, if you you know put in an essay a written request, you want to go you know home for two months and, and take a leave of absence, or if you're on maternity leave or something like that, you can do that. That's fine. Um, and then, and the employer has obligations on termination as well. So you know, whether you terminate the relationship um, or they do, um, you know, that depends on your personal circumstances. But if they terminate it, you know, your employment for whatever reason, they have to offer you reasonable costs of your transportation home. Um, and they just have to offer it one time. It doesn't have to be an open-ended forever kind of a deal. They can, you know, you can go back to them six months later and ask for, you know, a flight. They're not responsible for your family members, and um, I always make a joke, but that you can, you know it's for your you know reasonable costs home. You can't you know say I want to go back to um, you know I'm going back to uh, let's see Australia by way of oh I've always wanted to see you know I want to go to Bali or something like that. It has to be you know cost of transportation home. Uh, and uh, they are also required to notify USCIS and withdraw your LCA. So if they have, you know, their own legal team or, um, you know, whoever is handling it, they're probably aware of this as well. And so a lot of times people are like, oh, no one's going to, who's going to know? Well, they have requir reporting requirements on their own because if they don't notify USCIS, technically they're still on the hook to pay you the prevailing wage, which I discussed above. So they're also very careful about that. And again, if they have their own immigration attorneys, they're going to advise them of that. So that's something just to, to be aware of. Um, uh, in terms of the fees, who's responsible for the fees? You know, I hope that the employer pays all of the fees. I hope that for all of you. But that's not necessarily always, you know, realistic, and that's not the case. Um, so you should be aware of who is responsible. So if you are going to pay any of the fees, first of all, you know you have to be paid at least the prevailing wage, <clears throat> but um, 
more than you know more than the prevailing wage really is what you would have to be you know be paid. Um, so let's say for example uh, the prevailing wage <clears throat> is sixty thousand and your salary is sixty thousand. You can't pay a penny towards the legal fees or the government financing fees <clears throat> because your salary would drop below the prevailing wage. Who will know? Somebody will know. I promise you, it'll come back. You know, it'll come up like at a visa interview, possibly, or some. You know, let's say you know a few months later, you want to file a change of employer petition. You switch your H and B to another company. Um, USCIS can ask for your pay stubs. And for for a couple reasons, one to show you're still employed, but two to show you're you know being paid the right wage. So it can come up later. Um, my you know view is that the fraud fee, <clears throat> it's weird because there's not a whole lot of you know I've gone to the Depart Department of Labor <clears throat> um, guidance on it and USCIS. It's all very conflicting. Well, not conflicting, it's vague, it's gray. The training fee absolutely must be paid by the employer. That's very clear. The fraud fee, um, it's not as clear, but it should also probably be paid by the employer. Um, you know, you can't set up a kind of a backdoor agreement where they pay it and you reimburse them, or they pay it and they deduct it from your salary. You can't have anything like that. Um, you know, n n no funny business. Um, government other fees may be paid by you. Um, the I-129 fee possibly, and then the premium processing fee to, you know, especially if it's for your benefit because you need to travel or you want the peace of mind. Um, but again, you have to be paid at least that much more than the prevailing wage. So your your salary, if the prevailing wage is sixty, you would need to be paid, you know, sixty two thousand or something like that. So prevailing wage is the number one key. Um, again, though, wherever possible, hopefully they'll pay, and that would be, you know, that's the best thing for you. <clears throat> um, on on that note, H one B audits and enforcement. There has been, a, you know, a very <clears throat> steady increase in fraud investigations and unannounced worksite visits. I've had clients, you know call me and say, oh, we just had a, you know, someone from ICE just visit us. And they asked to see our payroll records. And they talked to the HR person and the foreign national and asked them what they were doing. And really, they're coming to make sure to, that you are doing what we said you're doing in the petition, you know, that um, if we said you're going to be the, you know, again, I, I hate going to the classic, but it's a software engineer, that you're actually doing those duties uh, and you're not actually you know, answering the phone or you're not, you know, working in the file room or, you know, making copies or things like that, that you're actually performing the duties. Um, and then in terms of payroll records, they can check to see again, here comes, you know, it's the prevailing wage requirement again. So it does happen and it's really common, to be quite honest. Um, and, you know, it's just something, again, to be aware of in case, let's say, for instance, an employer, um, not that you would suggest anything different, but maybe your employer is like, oh, let's, I've done this in the past. This has worked before. Let's just say you're going to be the accountant, and um, I promise you it's going to be OK. And really, you're like you know, an, exe you know, an admin assistant or something like that. It's something to be aware of that could affect your future as well. Um, and again, you know, prevailing wage. Um, for those of you <coughs> who have spouses and children, um, the visa, related visa is called, it's an H-4. There's no employment authorization, but they can go to school. Um, and then, so let's see, what happens when you read six years? Is six years really six years? It is, it is really six years, but there are a few, um, you know, exceptions, which I had mentioned earlier. One is recapture time spent abroad. So over the course of six years, you know, a lot of people, you can you can recapture any time physically spent abroad. It doesn't have to be in your home country. Let's say you go to Europe for vacation, or you go to Australia for business a lot, or you go to China um, for uh, vacation, or whatever it is. Any any of those trips outside physically outside of the U.S. you should keep track of because towards the end of your six years, that time will be and 
and um, is going to be, actually, I should say, very, very valuable. You, wanna, you can recapture that in case you are kind of stuck in a pinch and you need a little bit more time um, because of your green card. So it's just a matter of keeping track of those trips. Um, you can, you know, usually visa stamps and, you know, the actual physical ink stamps in your passport along with old itineraries and things like that. Um, are good. It's a good idea to keep track of all of that. You can easily recapture six months or a year <clears throat> that way. Um, and then I had mentioned this earlier, if you get to a certain point in your green card application where either your <clears throat> labor cert is pending for more than a year or your I-140 is approved, um, you can uh, extend your H-1B either in one-year increments or three-year increments, and you can continue to extend your H-1B while your green card application is pending. So that's really, really good. Um, I mean, it's not that great because it means that there, you know, of course, we'll get to this later, but there is a severe backlog in a lot of these application processes, but it is a good, um, at least there is, is an option. Um, Here's a quick uh, top 10 myths about the H-1B visa. Uh, you know, no H-1B for small company or startup. That's not true. You can have uh, H's for small companies or startups. It's really more about the viability of the company. So let's say it's a startup and has, you know, a million in, in funding. Uh, there's a, whether it's a private investor or <clears throat> the owner has done significantly well in, in some other company. So it's more about the company and, you know, the, whether, you know, the fact that it has an office and a business plan and a website and is, and is legitimately, you know, well-funded and set up. And really the issue that they're looking at is that two things. One, your job is, you know, you're, it's a professional job because a lot of times with startups or small companies, you know, you wear a lot of different hats. You're not just the accountant. You're also the... Um, you know, sometimes you're the, uh, you know, payroll person, payroll administrator. Sometimes you're the, um, you're answering phones, you're the office manager, you're this, you're that. And again, it, it takes away from the professional occupation. And so that's one danger. And the other is just to make sure that the company can not only cover overhead, but also to pay, you know, your wage in order to meet the prevailing wage. Um, so that's, that's my little spiel on startups. It is possible as long as it's viable. Um, there's no advertising requirement for the H-1B, although with all these reforms, excuse me for a second, with all the reforms that they are suggesting, um, there are, you know, there is some language about imposing <clears throat> some new requirements, advertising requirements for the H-1B petitions. It hasn't gone through. Um, this was all initially introduced. Uh, I think, you know, late in the spring, early in the summer. And so, but for now, there there's no duty to advertise. Uh, you can change employers. Um, you don't get a new six-year period if you change employers. That's always the, you know, big misconception. And then the, the next, the biggest misconception is this 10-day grace period after a layoff. I, you know, there is no grace period. If you're laid off, your status terminates immediately. So, you know, that's something to be sure you know before you, uh, or if you quit, let's say even if you're not laid off, if you quit, this, the day, the moment you give notice, that's when your status terminates. So you want to be very careful about that. Um, you can go to school part-time on an H-1B, so you could work part-time and possibly attend, you know, a master's program or something like that if you'd like. Um, and then, you know, you have to, I mentioned this, you ha if you're going to file under, you know, the cap, you have to make sure that you've completed the degree. And even if you, you, let's say you finish the degree program requirements in December and you don't actually walk until, you know, May or June, whenever the school's graduation is, if you don't actually get a copy of the degree, you can actually get a copy um, or a letter from the registrar's office. And it has to be from the registrar. It can't be from your, um, you know, your academic advisor or anything like that from the registrar saying, you know, so-and-so, as of whatever date, has, um, you know, met all of the degree requirements and is in full, you know, full compliance or whatever. <clears throat> um, so then that's important to note. Uh, premium processing increases chances of approval. Normally, that's not true. <laughs> it's not. Um, 
But I will say this last, and I said this last time in my webinar, um, my, in this last year in the CAP, <clears throat> the H-1B CAP, all of my cases that were premium processing were actually receded. I mean, I'm sure it was a coincidence. I just thought it was funny. I, I, so I've always said that it doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter, <clears throat> because it shouldn't put you at an advantage or disadvantage. Uh, so I'm sure it was just a fluke, but, um, you know, it, it's something, if you can, it does buy you a little bit of peace of mind, but it, by no means is it necessary because, um, you know, you have until, if you file in April, you have until October. And usually, hopefully during that time, you get the decision. Um, another big myth, no one will check if you're actually working in the position. That's and absolutely not true. Uh, like I said, they do have random work site visits and then must have a U.S. degree to qualify. Uh, that's not true. Foreign degrees are okay as long as they're evaluated and found to be the equivalent of a U.S. degree. So, um, and you know, there are lots of companies out there uh, that we work with and I'm sure there are tons of others that you can find so you can get an equivalency of your degree which comes in handy if, for instance, you know, you're graduating with your for your master's or your doctorate um, or even your bachelor's and you have a um, degree um, a foreign degree from abroad you can actually file your h1b based on that degree you don't it doesn't have to be a u.s degree so that's something else worth worth uh, exploring <coughs> excuse me okay so the cap has been met now what so which is where we are right now for those of you who are you know let's say you're in your opt what are your options? Um, you can get an H-1B for CAP-exempt organizations, which is what I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> the employer is not subject to the CAP, so you can basically file any time if you um, want. You could file, you know, next week. This applies to, and it's, it's very clearly defined, and you have to be very careful to make sure that the organization is CAP-exempt. Um, so institutes of higher education, so universities and colleges, uh, nonprofit organizations affiliated with an institute of higher higher education. So it doesn't mean just a nonprofit. There are tons of nonprofits out there. So it has to be affiliated with a university. Nonprofit research organization, again very specific, or a government research organization, very specific. Um, but if, I mean, it does definitely apply, or if you have that option, this is, that would be a great way to kind of be here and work. And then um, if you do want to switch to a private employer, you would be subject to the, to the cap um, because you haven't been counted yet. So, um, you know, it's not, you know, it's not the, the it's not going to solve all your problems, but it's definitely something that would, um, you know, kind of get you some time. Okay, so that's the H-1B. If you have any other questions about it, there have been a lot typed up here. I don't know that I'm going to have time to go through all of them because there are so many, but what I'll do is I'll print out um, questions and try and answer them individually after the webinar. And again, feel free to email me your questions as well. So let's see, the next, so let's move on. So that's the H-1B. Some other options are um, one of my favorites are the NAFTA, the free trade <coughs> agreement visas. They're similar in the H-1B in that they uh, require, it's the professional occupation and a degree, but they don't have a lot of the, they don't have the H-1B, the timing restrictions, and, um, and uh, well, the E-3 has the prevailing wage requirement, but otherwise, they, you know. So anyway, so they're good options for Chileans and Singaporeans. I mentioned this earlier, <coughs> there's the H-1B one. Um, there's no timing restriction. You file the application directly at the consulate, the U.S. consulate um, in, in your home country. You have to be a national, you know, you have to have a Chilean or Singaporean passport. But it's a great, great option. And then you can switch from that. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's shorter term and, and has a few other restrictions. But you can switch from that to a regular H-1B later if you'd like. There's the TN NAFTA visa for Canadians and Mexicans, which I'll discuss a little bit more in depth. Um, the, it, it's different because it's, it's for two things. The job categories are very, very specific. You have to look at the TN appendix. If you just Google TN appendix 
and this number, 1603.b.1. Uh, just Google that, and it's a very specific list of occupations. Um, so you have to fit within that. Uh, and then another important distinction is that Canadians can apply <clears throat> at the port of entry. So you just kind of, you know, if you're flying through or driving, you know, that's, you just literally hand them the application, um, and they kind of they adjudicate it on the spot. And for Mexican nationals, you apply for the visa at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico. So in for that, for those. You know, there's no filing fee. And same thing for the E3. The E3 is specific for Australians. Okay. Oh, well, I guess I can give you a little bit more information um, about those. Let's see. For E3s, um, that's also, oh, like I said, that's a prevailing wage um, that you have to meet in, in the LCA. So that's also prepared and submitted at the consulate in Australia. So the first one, at least, has to be submitted there. These are all great options, but very limited, obviously, because so, you have to be a national of those countries. Another option <clears throat> is there's a J-1 visa for exchange visitors. Um, it's not really the greatest. This is good for those of you who, um, if you are able to, you know, are going back to your home country and then want to come back at some point, or if you want to, you know, for professors and research scholars, slightly different. Um, this is really for people who are abroad. <clears throat> As you can see, it has to be a, um, a degree from a foreign institution and one year of work experience outside of the U.S. So really, you know, the J-1 in, in this, as a trainee, you should be, you know, going and coming from abroad. Um, and uh, same with the intern. Uh, foreign teachers can teach it, you know, schools as a J-1. It can't be extended um, for, the, for the foreign teachers. There's a J-1, like I said, professor, research scholar uh, for university and research position. So that could be an alternative to the H-1B. A lot of times universities, they may not, you know, uh, sponsor H-1B. They may only offer the J-1. So um, it's a good idea or it's, it's a good option, I should say. Something you should always, you know, be aware of um, is that some J-1 visa holders, not all, um, are subject to a two-year home residency requirement. So it means once they finish their program, they are required to go home for two years. Uh, there is a possibility to apply for a waiver of this, you know, based on your specifics. But it is something to be aware of if if you do get a job offer and they do sponsor J-1s, you should find out, and it's country specific. So you would have to see if your country is on the, um, the list, and then, you know, we could kind of figure it out. I'm more than happy to look it up. Um, there's a 30-day grace period. So for F-1, we had mentioned earlier, there's a 60-day grace period. For j one there's a 30-day grace period at the end of the term that's on your DS-2019. Um, another option is the H-3 trainee, which Again, it's not really the best for those of you because if you've had your OPT, because if you think about it, it's F1 and then OPT, which is that's also supposed to be your training. So it's really hard <clears throat> to show that you need more training in terms of the J1 or the H3. Uh, so again, this is an option if perhaps you know you finish things and then you go, um, you know, you work, let's say in um, I don't know. London for a year, and then you you want to come back. At that point, you know you could do this, but it is an option. You do have to show that training is not available in your home country, and that um, whatever skills you learn in the U.S. will benefit your career abroad. So, it, in some ways, you have to show that you have a job lined up, or you have an option once you're finished um, with your training. So, those are you know a couple of other options. Um, uh, another you know, good visa uh, category that may apply to a lot of you is the L1A or the L1B, especially if, um, let's say, you are finishing and you get you have a great job offer um, to go work with a, a large company, <clears throat> you know, abroad. Um, let's say it's with uh, Nike, Nike's offices in Tokyo or something like that. And they want to hire you to go manage or to work there for a year or two. 
if you go and do that, then they could transfer you back um, to the U.S. offices for Nike. So it would have to be the same. But there's an L1A, that's for managers and executives, and there's the L1B, which is specialized knowledge. Um, and specialized knowledge is very, very technical. I know it sounds like, you know, it's easy, like, oh, he, he's familiar with our business practices, but it has to really be specialized, and, and they define that as something that you can't train somebody, easily train somebody on um, within six months. And if you think about it, you know, in six months, you could probably train a lot of people on, on a lot of things. So that's something to keep in mind. But if you do have, maybe, and again, another option, I mean, maybe you have already worked for um, a company that has an office abroad. You, you have to show you worked there for at least one year, and um, one year within the immediately preceding three years. And um, so it doesn't mean one, if you worked for them you know, 10 years ago for one year, you can't use that. It has to be within the last three years, which again, unless you're in a you know, one or two year master's program, it's probably not going to work. And so that's why looking forward, again, if you get a job offer abroad, you could maybe you know, think about it big picture long term of going there for a little while. And then possibly, if it fits, they could transfer you back on this. Um, on this visa, and uh, it's based, again, on the corporate relationship of the foreign company and the U.S. company. So it has to, you know, you have to show it's a parent, uh, parent subsidiary, affiliate, et cetera. Uh, there is a new office, L for new companies. So let's say you did work for a company abroad and they want to establish a new company here, a new office is what we would call it. You, you know, they can do that. That's also a good option. Um, and they want to send you over to kind of set it up and start and run the company. Uh, there are some specific requirements to be aware of, but it's a, a really good option um, that, you know, you can possibly take advantage of. It's only good for one year, so that's something to be um, aware of. And you can, I mean, not you can, but you, you, well, you can file to extend it at the end of one year. There is a total of seven years. Um, so, you know, that's good, but after that first year, if you file it as a new office, if you file it like the regular way and there's already an office here, you get the three years. Um, but for the new office, you have to show that the company's sales are doing, you know, well and you've hired, they've hired some people and, you, you know, sales are going up, tax returns, things like that. <clears throat> the L1A is for a total of seven years, L1B is a total of five years. Um, spouses and children receive the L2 visa, and the good part about the L is that spouses also can apply for a work permit. It's, it's basically the same as your OPC card. It's an employment authorization document, that same card, and it's unrestricted. So that's a great, great option, um, you know, whether your spouse is able to get the, you know, L1 or you are, and um, you can, because then the other spouse also gets work authorization. And that's a good basis. There's an EB-13 green card, which is um, for multinational executives and managers. Uh, so very similar. It's based on the company relationship and all of that. So this is a, a good long-term, big picture option. Um, there is, OK, moving on, the E-1, E-2 treaty trade and treaty investor visa. So. For those of you who are, you know, don't want to work for a company or entrepreneurs and want to set up your own company, this is probably um, the better option. Um, it depends on whether or not your country has a treaty with the U.S. Uh, you can check the treaty country list, and I give the the travel.state.gov um, link here. And uh, so your treaty country has to be on, you know, and that's your passport country, has to be on the list. First of all, not all countries have, the, um, have a treaty with the U.S. And then, um, and then you can see what the specific um, requirements are. Um, at least half of the company has to be owned by the treaty country. And you can either start up a company or you can buy a company. So the difference between the two is, I mean, it's, for, it's in, the, in the kind of <laughs> title of the actual visa category. One is a treaty trader and the other is an investor. So the trader it has to be trade between your treaty country and the U.S. So, you know, import-export business. This, that's the, you know, kind of quintessential um, example. 
uh, investor visas where you want where you you know want to start up your own you know business and or you want to buy a business you have to make a substantial investment substantial is again not defined um, but you know substantial meaning you know more than at least more than a hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars I mean really and it depends on the business plan because different businesses require different amounts of capital uh, or at least starting capital so a restaurant for example would probably require a lot more than um, a production company because um, anytime where there's a service involved rather than a product, you know, where there's inventory or equipment or, you know, like a restaurant, I say, you know, you need plates, you need tablecloths, you need menus, chefs, cooking utensils, special ovens, and <clears throat> all those things. Those costs really add up. You want a um, liquor license, you need all of those things. Whereas if you are a <clears throat> PR company, Really, what you need is a computer, a desk, a phone, and, and and the way things are now. I mean, you could virtually start a business anywhere, so that's where um, it would be difficult um, to show that you're making a substantial investment. Anyway, something to keep in mind. Uh, like the L1, spouses and children um, receive uh, dependent visas, but are, can also apply for a work permit. So that's important. Um, O1 visas. Uh, there, it's, I feel like my my specialty, but um, they are really for aliens of extraordinary ability. So for some of you who are uh, further on in your careers, I mean, this isn't the right category for people who have, you know, who are have just started out in your career, um, who are relatively young. You are um, required to show that you meet a certain level of uh, expertise in your field. So it's split up between O1A and O1B. So it's science, education, business, athletics. And then O1B is the arts or motion picture and TV. So for those of you who are you know, in entertainment, I actually have a separate um, O&P <coughs> entertainment webinar, I think, in a few weeks maybe. And so if you are listening and you are more interested in the O1 and the green card, uh, you can kind of look look at our website and register for that. I don't want to go too much into it, but it is definitely an option um, for some of you, especially uh, if you're in school or if you're in higher, you know, if you're doing your master's or you're doing your doctorate. Right now in the sciences, uh, the O is, is a really good visa category. Um, you know, you have to show that you're at the very top of your field. Here are the standards listed here. Again, I don't want to go too in-depth, but, um, you know, there's a lot to show, and then some types of evidence. It's going to be awards, press, uh, publications, <clears throat> authorship of articles. If you, you know, sat on a panel or judged, uh, judged a panel, um, high salary, commercial success, and and so these are just some examples um, of some evidence that you would require for the O1. Okay, I think that's all of the the visa options. Um, and these are just my personal tips to you. People always ask, how do I bring it up? When do I bring it up? What do I do? Um, obviously, there's all the, you know, there's LinkedIn and all the social networking sites. In terms of jobs, you should go to your school. I'm sure a lot of, you know, you have a career services office there. I would take advantage of whatever tools that they have available for you. Um, and just networking, really talking to people. There are placement agencies who I know um, could place you, and, and you can be upfront with them about your need for, you know, to for visa sponsorship, or that you, you know, may or may not have work authorization, or you have your, o, you know, you have your OPT, so you you would be okay um, if there's a, you know, chamber of commerce, <clears throat> local, your local embassy and consulate, wherever you are in whatever city here in LA. Let's, you know, for instance, if you go to the, <clears throat> you know, Brazilian consulate. They tend to have, you know, postings or things where, you know, a lot of times they have a, a there's a Brazilian company and they only want to hire Brazilian people, you know, and, and not in a negative way, but just in a friendly way where they want to help out people, um, you know, their brothers and sisters and, you know, that kind of a thing. So it's, it's just a nice thing. And, um, you know, something that you should focus on is, uh, you know, your international perspective, um, foreign talent, 
a competitive advantage, you know, the cultural diversity, um, it's a global, you know, in a global economy, those types of things, I think, you know, really are important uh, to the U.S. And um, so, again, I know it's not an easy conversation to have with an employer, but it's something that you, I, I think, you know, do need to have. And um, hopefully you do the OPT, and at that point they think you're great. And then beyond that, you know, things hopefully will work out however, um, however they will work out, you know. Um, so that's the visa portion. And now I'm going to switch to green cards. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm going to check the time really quickly. Um, we'll kind of quickly go through green cards. And, you know, if you do need to log off, feel free to log off <clears throat> and email me your questions. Uh, the PowerPoint slides uh, will be available. We try and upload them later. They should be up later this afternoon. <clears throat> and uh, if not, definitely by tomorrow. So, you know, feel free to look at them later. Green card. That's what, you know, if you do want to stay big picture long term, <clears throat> there is a green card. Uh, and there are lots of options. Uh, the green card itself, it is, you know, it's not citizenship, but it is permanent residence. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Um, some people call it, an, you know, an LPR, legal permanent resident. <clears throat> there are different ways of, you know, calling it. The card itself used to be green. That's why they call it that, but now it's not. It's got all, it's white and has all sorts of holograms and, and things on it. But once you do become a, um, a lawful um, permanent resident, then, um, or is it, it's legal permanent resident. Once you do become an LPR, <clears throat> you, um, unless it's taken, you know, basically you're, I think at that point you can look forward to citizenship if you do want. Anyways, how do you get there? There is something called Green Card Lottery, www.travel.state.gov. I've said that website several times. The registration period actually <clears throat> uh, opens next week. So if you qualify, if your um, country is on the list of eligible countries, um, I urge you to apply. It's um, also called, it's, I just want to go back, it's also called the DV Lottery Diversity Immigrant Visa Program. There are 50,000 green cards that they give away every year. You have to show at least a high school, you know, you have at least a high school diploma. Um, but again, that's pretty much it. The application is free. You can do it online. You don't need, um, I mean, I write it here. If you want our assistance, we can. But I really, I mean, honestly, you can do it yourself. You can just go to the website, upload. You just have to upload a picture, fill out your biographic information. and. It's free. There are a lot of companies and agencies out there that will charge you, um, you know, $50 or $100 to do it. Uh, don't, don't go through any other website other than this one I, I have here. The last, the end of it, I mean, the web address should have a travel.state.gov. Um, so if it's a, you know, greencardlottery.com or something like that, don't even waste your time. I've heard lots of stories where people are notified that they won the lottery and all they have to do is pay, you know, $2,000 or something. And so it's, it's fake. So make sure you're really careful about that. Do it. Starts next week. It's only for one month. So uh, I have it it's in bold red here. I didn't want anybody to miss it. October 1st, starting at 12 noon Eastern. Um, and it ends November 2nd. So literally one month. But make sure you go and apply. It's based on your country of birth. So that's something else to, to know. So if if you were born somewhere else and you have this kind of passport in case you're, you look at it and you think you're not eligible. And then you can also cross-charge to your spouse. So if you're married and um, your spouse is uh, eligible but you are not, you can both still apply using your spouse's country of birth. And again, if you want assistance, we can help. Um, but it's something you can do. Um, so I didn't actually check, I, I, the last time I checked this list, these are the countries um, who are not eligible. They're listed here. So, uh, and, and it just means that <clears throat> they have, you know, their, the population here in the U.S. Is, is high. So they've kind of said that you can't, you know, they're not eligible for the green card lottery. Um, again, I looked at this, I think, in July or 
I think I believe it was in July, so it may have been updated since then. You just want to make sure you double check, um, and uh, hopefully you are eligible and you can apply and you should apply. Okay, so that's my green card lottery. Do it if you can. It's free. Uh, some other green cards. So let's say you're not eligible or you missed the window. <clears throat> um, there are two categories. So there's green card lottery, then there's family-based green cards, and then there's employment-based green cards. Family-based green cards, I'll just run through quickly. Immediate relatives of U.S. citizens, USC is U.S. citizens, um, spouse, parent, or minor children of U.S. citizens. So for those of you who are in school, you know, life happens, love happens, you fall in love, you know, you can't help if you know, whatever happens, happens. Hopefully, I mean, it should be, not that it should be, it has to be for legitimate reasons. And, um, you know, it's for, for love and all of those things. Let's say you do, you are dating somebody and you do want to get married. There is a green card option. You do get immediate benefits. You know, once you're married, you file. Within two to three months, you'll get work and travel authorization. Um, and then usually a few months after that, there's an interview. Um, with at, at a field office local to you with an officer where they ask you questions and just to make sure that the it's a bona fide marriage, it's legitimate, you guys are living together as husband and wife. And then once it's approved, you get a, a conditional green card, which is a two-year green card. Um, and this is for a marriage case. But um, And then at the end of that two years, you have to file another application showing you guys are still together. <clears throat> and then about a year after that, so three years after you become a green card holder, you can apply for citizenship. So that's the timeline if you do get married to a US citizen. Um, another quick note to make, adult child has to be 21 years old. So a lot of times people say, oh, <clears throat> uh, I, have, I just had a baby here. Um, does that give me anything? Or you know, um, once your baby, who you just had, turns 21, so maybe in like 20 years, they can sponsor you. Um, for a green card, which is a long way off. Um, and then a quick update, this you know, happened in late June <clears throat> per the repeal of DOMA. Same-sex same -sex couples are now eligible for immediate benefits, which is great, great news. And um, our office has filed <clears throat> quite a few. And so if, if you weren't eligible before, but you are eligible now, that's definitely something you should take advantage of. Um, so that covers basically immediate relatives. Uh, anything outside of an immediate relative is going to take much, much longer, which is my next slide. All of this information, by the way, is on travel.state.gov. Uh, it's the State Department's website. And it's pulled from what's called the Visa Bulletin, which is updated every month. Um, and basically, they kind of evaluate where they are with visas and green cards and update it. And that's where you can find out all of this information. <coughs> <coughs> Um, so unmarried adult children, I mean, you really have to look at the wording and think about it. But if you do have, um, you know, either you're related to a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, um, there are some backlogs, uh, as you can see. So for instance, you know, um, I have here in bold, if your um, spouse has a green card, you can actually file um, for yourself, and that was eligible in August and, and also, I believe, this month. Um, unmarried adult children of green card holders, you know, there's a seven-year backlog. So if your parents, you know, have one, <clears throat> um, and if you're married, there's a 10-year backlog. Um, if your brother or sister is a U.S. citizen, you could go ahead and file, but that's a 12-year 12, 12 backlog, and there are, there are rumors they're talking about taking, you know, getting rid of that category. So, um, anyways, I mean, it's, you know, time goes much quicker. This looks like a long time, but time really does, um, you know, it really goes fast. So, if, if this is an option, let me know. I'm more than happy to answer questions, and you can always check the visa bulletin. So, that's family-based. And then there's employment-based, which um, we kind of touched upon. Um, someone just asked, adult child. So you become an adult at 21, um, not 18. Uh, so it would be 21. Um, uh, employment-based, so, and I'll go through them. They're EB1 through EB5, EB meaning employment-based. So EB1, EB2, 3, 4, 5. EB1 is first preference. This is kind of the you know top of the top. This is how 
you know, celebrities and um, not necessarily celebrities, but people who have done really well in their careers even. Um, they are at the top of their field and, and they're only compared to others in their specific field. Um, and you can self-sponsor in the EB1 category, which is also really great. First pref preference, it's quick, but the standard is really, really high to show that, you know, you have won this, you know, an, a, an award uh, or some awards, you won an Emmy, you won a Nobel Prize, you, um, you know, made this important invention or, you know, and then also I talked about that multinational executive and manager with the L visa that's also included in this. Um, the good part is faster processing and wait times, but again, it's something that you, I think, some of you may or may not be eligible for, but it's something to, you know, kind of consider, uh, but requires a lot of evidence. EB2 is second preference, and, um, you know, so different from the EB1, which is self-sponsorship, EB2 requires employer sponsorship, and, um, so this is for advanced degree holders, which means master's or higher degree, or um, the job requires a bachelor's plus five years of experience. EB2 is um, everything except for the NIW, the National Interest Waiver, is sponsored by the employer. So it does require an employer. Um, somebody just asked if I could explain more about NIWs. NIWs are pretty complex. Uh, there's a National Interest Waiver where basically you have to demonstrate that you're making contributions in an area of um, national interest and the interest of the United States. So it's, it's, a high, it's a high standard, but something that I'm more than happy to talk about more specifically if, if you do have specific questions. Uh, there's a SCADA group two alien of exceptional ability in the arts, sciences, or performing arts. That's also really good, too. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's another option. Um, EB3 is third preference, and that's for <clears throat> jobs that require um, professionals with a bachelor's degree or foreign equivalent or skilled workers with two years of experience or other workers. And within that, there are several, you know, there are some distinctions. Um, so, so EB1, going backwards, is self-sponsored. Um, or it's, you know, with the company or an, out, you know, there's the outstanding reacher, researcher, professor, and those are, um, you know, sponsored again by the employer or the company. EB2 is sponsored by the company or your employer, so it requires a job offer. And the most common form of green card sponsorship is called PERM. Uh, which, so now that's on, I've gone back in, in the slides, I'll move forward, but that's EB2 and EB3 requires PERM. So the PERM-based green card process is the, probably the most common where a lot of you have heard about these backlogs and, and recruitment and testing the labor market and all of that. The first step is the PERM labor cert, um, and that's where the employer has to conduct good faith recruitment efforts. So that's where they place the Sunday ads and they advertise for your job, basically. Um, as long as, um, you know, they can show that there are no qualified U.S. workers and <clears throat> um, they can continue. You file the, the PERM labor cert with the Department of Labor. Right now, those are taking about six or seven months to be certified. It's, you know, with the Department of Labor. And then once it's certified, you can file a second step, which is an I-140. Uh, and that's really more based on the employer, <clears throat> you know, their ability to pay in their documents. And then this is where there's a little bit of, um, this is, you know, why people want to try and get into EB2 over EB3, because until your priority date is current, you can't file this third step, which is the adjustment of status. <clears throat> um, and once you file the third step, you get work and travel authorization. So until you have that, um, you're really kind of um, tied to your, um, you know, your visa. So if it's an H-1B or whatever it is, um, so it's something to be aware of. And between steps two and three, knowing when you're going to be current is based on this chart, which is, all, is based on the uh, visa bulletin, which is what I was talking about before for the family-based category. They also have it for employment-based. All of the C's mean current, so if you look at it, um, EB1, across all, you know, no matter your country of birth, it's, it's current in all categories. 
EB2 is current in most countries except for China and India. <clears throat> and then EB3, there's a backlog for almost, you know, actually there's a backlog for everybody and for some, you know, longer than others. It looks like, you know, for India is much longer um, and Philippines much longer. So that's where it's important to make the distinction between the two and to really work with your employer as well as an attorney to figure out, you know, um, what to do and how to get, you know, the, the best timeline for you as possible. There's so many factors in the PERM-based uh, process that uh, it's hard to really kind of go into too much depth just in this kind of a webinar power, you know, PowerPoint. But um, the important thing is to, to know that the PERM is really based on the job requirements, the minimum requirements for the job. So some issues deciding between the two. It's not based on your background. So a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I have a master's degree, so it's EB2. Well, if your job and if, if your employer, you know, that is, doesn't have the master's degree as the absolute, like, bare bones minimum requirement um, for your job, then it's, that's, then, you know, you would probably fall under EB3 if they're like, oh, well, no, actually somebody with a bachelor's degree can also do this job. In fact, we have people with bachelor's degrees, and, and, and the Department of Labor can come back and ask you for that and say, are there other people working in that same position? What are their, you know, what are their qualifications? So that's where, um, you know, it becomes a little bit tricky. Um, you can't tailor the minimum requirements either, you know, to have a foreign language requirement, like this person has to speak, um, you know, Japanese because we have a lot of Japanese clients that doesn't work, unless you're like a translation company or something like that, where it would make sense that it would be a part of your job, but not that it's just more convenient. Um, and, you know, there are some other points here, but um, usually when to start it, I would say probably in your, you know, fourth year of your being in your H&B at that point, I think you have a good idea of whether or not you want to stay and, and whether or not you want to stay with your employer, how things are going. But something to be careful of is, let's say you do want to use, um, let's say the employer says, you know, there's a bachelor's degree plus five year, you know, you have to have a bachelor's degree plus six years of experience um, for the job. And let's say you've worked for that company from the second you graduated, so all of your experience is only with that company, you can't use employment experience gained with that, this, your sponsoring employer. So that's something to keep in mind, too, at the, you know, in the beginning, um, because it may end up hurting you down the line. Unless you're, you've, you know, your job is, is you know, pretty different, you can't use that experience. So that's where people come to us and that, um, that kind of holds them back or puts them in a different category. Again, this is all very complex. I don't want to get too nitpicky with you, but uh, it is, it's complex. Um, some other categories, again, I don't know, if, you know whether or not they apply. I just want, to have, want you to have that information. There's a religious worker, immigrant visa, green card, um, the EB-4. There's an EB-5 for those of you who have wealthy and generous <laughs> family or friends. Um, that's the million dollar green card and then there's an EB-5 regional um, regional program, regional center, so that's $500,000 um, or it's, you know, more of a pooled investment. There are very specific requirements. It's not just like paying. You know, you have to really um, do some due diligence, but it, it may be an option for some of you and I'm more than happy to give you some more information about that if you would like. Um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, looks like it's the end of uh, the slideshow and the PowerPoint and the webinar. I have really, really, um, I appreciated all of you who joined us today. Thank you so much. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email me directly. I will print out all of the questions that were submitted here. I hope you found this informative. Uh, please feel free to give me feedback on, on any topics that you would like to be discussed in my next PowerPoint. My email address is here, our website, our phone number. Feel free to, um, to give us a call. Uh, well, email is always e easier, I suppose. And um, please go to our website to look at our schedule for other webinars in case you're interested. Thank you. Have a great day.